Bible study. Does that sound good? Welcome. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to Hi ladies, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning to everybody here and hello to the ladies who are watching online. We're so excited that you're joining us this morning. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we come before your throne of grace and we praise you. We praise you because you are good, God. You are holy, holy, holy. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth, God, and you love us you chose to create out of the love that you had perfectly within yourself, Lord God. I thank you that you've given us your word and the fact that it is truth that we can rely on. It is a firm foundation, a plumb line against which we can press everything up against, Lord. I just pray that we would be doers of your word and not just hearers, Lord God. I pray that the things that we learn today and for the next several weeks we would apply them to our lives, Lord, and actually live out what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Christ. Lord, thank you so much for each one of these women who have chosen to participate in this study and have a desire to grow in their knowledge of you. And Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every one today and in the weeks ahead. God, we love you and we praise you. I pray that you would be honored and glorified that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, Lord God. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 
All right, ladies. So last week, I mentioned that we've been very intentional in the way that we put the study guide together and also in the opportunities that we're going to provide for you to grow and learn more about the process of Bible study. So one of the most important steps in Bible study is actually determining the context of the text for whatever book or passage that you're studying. So what is context? Context is the circumstances that form the setting for an event, statement, or idea, in terms of which it can be fully understood and assessed. It is the interrelated conditions in which something occurs. So that's the dictionary definition for you, but simply put, context sets the framework for our understanding. Remember, the Bible contains 66 books written over the course of at least 1,600 years by 40 different human authors who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible was written by real people facing real circumstances. And through each author, God has chosen to convey a particular message at a particular place and time in history to a particular audience. That message does not change, just as the divine author of scripture does not change. The author determines the meaning of the message, not us. We must seek to understand what was said to them and the original audience in order to rightly apply it to us now. If our understanding of the Bible is limited to what seems right in our own eyes as women living in present day USA, we can actually miss vital details and potentially walk away from our study thinking or even believing something that God never intended because we're operating with only part of the information that we need. Whether or not we realize it, each one of us actually approaches scripture with our own personal framework. We have our own worldview that impacts the way that we see, hear, read, and even interpret things. Our eyes, our ears, our heart, and our mind can actually mislead us. So what's at stake? What happens if we misunderstand God's word? Well, we risk two things. First, we risk missing the point of the text. And if we miss the point of the text, then we could potentially mislead ourselves and we could potentially mislead others. And then the second thing that we risk is actually missing God altogether in the text. We risk diminishing him instead of magnifying him. Here's an example. Let's turn to Philippians 4. Turn to Philippians 4 with me. Okay, Philippians 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How many of you have seen this verse on a poster, on framed artwork, or even clothing? Yeah, pretty much everyone, right? <laughs> so on its own, this verse seems to empower and encourage us to transcend our circumstances in order to achieve our goals with God's help, of course, right? Would it surprise you to learn that this verse is actually talking about finding contentment? Consider the context of this passage. The congregation in Philippi was actually very discouraged. They were suffering and they were facing a lot of opposition, the same opposition that Paul had faced. And he landed in prison Still, Paul writes from prison to encourage them. Let's look at verses 10 through 13 of chapter 4. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. 
You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Though Paul is literally in chains for the gospel of Jesus Christ, he says, with God's strength, I can learn and have learned how to be content regardless of the circumstances in which I find myself. Paul genuinely, sincerely was rejoicing in prison because he knew God was using his circumstances to advance the gospel. He knew that God would sovereignly use any circumstances that he called him to walk through for his glory and for his good. Is not the same true for us? How many of us could have had that attitude or would have that attitude if we ended up in prison? We can't have that attitude on our own. So applying this verse out of context means not only that we miss the point of the text, but we've also diminished God in the text. It's the difference between saying something about us achieving something and God achieving something by the power of Christ within us. There's a big difference. As we study God's word, we want to ensure that we understand it rightly. We want the message that he intended to be the message that we actually receive so that we can then take it and apply it rightly to our lives. How can we ensure that we are picking up what he's putting down? We study scripture by filtering it through three lenses. Imagine a telescope. A telescope magnifies a distant object to bring it into clear view. A telescope actually allows us to see what we could not observe with our own eyes. In the same way, looking at scripture through the literary, historical, and biblical lenses will magnify God, and it will bring the author's intended meaning into clear focus for us. So let's look at these three lenses a little bit. It's going to be almost two lectures in one. We're going to look at the lenses, and then we are going to spend time looking at the passages that you studied this week. So literary context. What is literary context? Literary context is the words around the text. The Bible contains many different types of literary genres, everything from poetry, wisdom, and epistles, to prophecy, law, narratives, apocalyptic literature, and more. And there are general rules for every single genre of literature, and there are literary devices for each. But what we need to remember is just the fact that the genre tells us how to read the text. That simple. Would we read and understand a poem the same way that we read and understand a novel? No. Likewise, we do not read and understand a psalm of David the same way that we read and understand Paul's letters. We wouldn't read and interpret a historical narrative like the book of Ruth the same way that we would read and interpret the book of Revelation. So what's the best way to identify the genre for the book that you're studying? Well, the best way really is to read the whole book from beginning to end, whenever possible. That's part of why that's gonna be your assignment starting this week, every single week. You're gonna be reading 1 Timothy from chapter one through chapter six, the whole thing in one sitting. So what genre is 1 Timothy? Well, it's a pastoral letter, an epistle, and we'll actually dig in a little bit more to understanding what that means next week. <clears throat> 
But just remember that the Bible is intelligently designed. It's not exactly chronological, but it puts together everything in a certain way for a specific purpose. To determine the literary context, we have to also look at the books right before the book that we're studying and actually the book right after. We look at those books to determine if they or even just some of the surrounding verses provide significant important details. So you didn't have to do this in your homework, but I actually did this. I went and looked at 1 Timothy. I read it from cover to, you know, chapter 1 to chapter 6. Then I backed up to the book before it, which is 2 Thessalonians. I read that. And then the book after 1 Timothy is actually 2 Timothy. So I looked at that as well. I'm telling you, it has never ceased to amaze me. When I went back and looked at both of those letters after reading 1 Timothy, I could tell it's no accident that it was put in that order. So for example, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, that's the one immediately before 1 Timothy 1. It's talking about people leading an undisciplined life, people walking in idleness. And the Apostle Paul actually exhorts them at the end of that letter, do not grow weary in doing good. Well, 1 Timothy reads almost like a response to what Paul just said, even though they were written to a completely different audience at a different time. It's, it's unbelievable. 1 Timothy actually talks about focusing on godliness and godly conduct, training for godliness. So Paul wrote 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, it could have been as many as six to seven years apart between the time that those two letters were written. Yet, Paul's opening remarks in the second letter to Timothy about guarding what has been entrusted to him and maintaining the standard of sound words flows seamlessly just off of the last few verses of 1 Timothy 1, or 1 Timothy. It's unbelievable. I encourage you, read it. If you want to, check it out and see for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. I have yet to study a book of the Bible where I did not gain at least some insight by taking that extra step of reading the passages or books before and after. Context actually provides us the opportunity to marvel at the divine author of Scripture. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Going forward, whenever you study a book of the Bible, I encourage you to identify the genre and read the text through the lens of the literary context in order to magnify God and to bring the author's intended meaning into focus. Now let's talk about historical context. Historical context is the world around the text. Emily Kurtz wrote, God's people were affected by history, and history was affected by God's people. This weaving of history with the events of the Bible is a crucial piece of the puzzle. Every word of the Bible was written at a certain point in history in the midst of a certain set of circumstances. To determine the historical context, we should ask some questions. For example, what are the major issues of the day for the original audience? What is the spiritual climate? Is this a time where the people of God are exhibiting faithfulness or faithlessness? What's the political climate at the time? There are fantastic resources written by biblical scholars and historians, study Bibles and Bible dictionaries, commentaries, websites. There's even Bible study software available. But the absolute best resource for discovering the historical context is the Bible itself. We can often identify the cultural and historical atmosphere of a book either by reading within the book itself or looking at the cross-references which lead us to other books of the Bible that were written at the same time or maybe address the exact same topic. 
Um, in this case, this week in particular, there's a ton about the Apostle Paul. So we had so many passages that we could have given you to study that would help you glean something that you could apply to your study of First Timothy. So instead of writing a synopsis of the historical context, we actually had you take the opportunity to study several passages of scripture so that you could better understand Paul and the major issues of the day, the political and the spiritual climate, all right? So let's look at these passages that you studied. Let's look at Acts chapter 7, verse 58. We're going to start there because this is Luke's first mention of Saul of Tarsus. Acts 7, 58. Okay. He says, Then they cast him, Stephen, out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man, man named Saul. Then skip down to chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And then look at chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So before his conversion, Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Like a raging bull with his nostrils flaring, Saul ravaged the church. He himself used the words raging fury to describe the conflict with those belonging to the way. Why was Saul actively seeking out opportunities to persecute the people of Jesus? Well, Saul did not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. Jesus was crucified, and the law states that anyone hung on a tree is cursed. So how could the Messiah be cursed? This happened to be a huge stumbling block for the Jewish people. Saul was a Pharisee. He was exceedingly zealous for the law, and he genuinely believed that he was actually serving God well in his opposition of this group of people that he deemed a dangerous sect. Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Can you imagine? The scribes and the Pharisees were supposed to know God, and they were supposed to help others to know him and follow him. But they did not follow God. They definitely didn't follow him with a pure heart because their religion was not true worship. It was rooted in their prideful hearts. Warren we Re Wearsby wrote, Throughout the centuries, Israel had refused to submit to God and obey truths he had revealed to them. Their ears did not hear the truth. Their hearts did not receive the truth. And their necks did not bow to the truth. As a result, they killed their own Messiah. The nation refused to accept the new truth that God was revealing to them from age to age. 
by the time Jesus came to the earth, the truth of God was encrusted with so much tradition that the people could not recognize God's truth when it presented itself, when he presented himself. Man's dead traditions had replaced God's living truth. We saw in these passages, Saul did not discriminate. It said it twice. Both men and women were dragged from their homes, beaten, imprisoned, compelled to blaspheme, and even killed. Religious bigotry is not something new. In fact, many innocent people today are taken hostage, maimed, and even murdered in the name of religion. Apart from God's grace, man's heart cannot be changed. Let's look at Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 19. Paul's conversion. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Just think about this for a minute. This is God in his sovereign grace, stopping Saul on the road to Damascus, stopping him from committing more evil. Matthew Henry wrote, let us not despair of the pardoning mercy of God for the greatest sin. It is a signal token of divine favor. If God, by the inward working of his grace, or the outward events of his providence stops us from prosecuting or executing sinful purposes. Saul was so busy breathing out threats and murder toward others that he did not recognize his own spiritual condition. He was a man that was desperate for Jesus, and he didn't know it. The Lord was beginning a good work in him, and no one but God 
could have imagined what would have come. And we'll get to learn so much more about this in the weeks to come. We found just three accounts in the book of Acts about Saul's conversion. This account in Acts 9 was written uh, according to Luke. It's Luke's account of the um, conversion. But Acts 22 and Acts 26 is Paul's account of his conversion. Each one includes additional details. Acts 26, 14 says, And when he had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, this is Paul speaking, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. What is that? To kick against the goads means to bring nothing but pain to yourself. A goad is a stick, a spiked stick or a stick with a spike on it. It's used to drive cattle and oxen. So instead of submitting and going the way of the master, unbroken bulls actually hurt themselves by pushing against the goads stabbing the goad actually deeper into their flesh. It is a fruitless effort. This tells us that Jesus had been prompting Saul, but Saul was resisting. By resisting Jesus, Saul was ultimately hurting himself and a lot of others in the process. His relationship with God was broken but he did not realize it. Just imagine this encounter with the almighty power of Jesus, this light completely surrounding him. Saul was blinded and utterly humbled. Did you notice he did not speak another word after that? Not one word. For three days he fasted and he prayed. John Wesley wrote, three days, an important season. So long he seems to have been in the pangs of the new birth. Scales growing over his eyes to intimate to him the blindness of the state he had been in. To impress him with a deeper sense of the almighty power of Christ. And turn his thoughts inward. Saul went to Damascus intending to bind those he deemed sinners. But Jesus intended to loose Saul from the bonds of his sin. Aren't you glad that it was not up to Ananias to decide what happened on that third day? Saul finally accepted the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah the Son of God. Saul trusted him by faith and was baptized in obedience to demonstrate outwardly the inward change. When he started on the road to Damascus, he was an enemy of the way. But now, he was an enemy of the Jews. Let's look at Acts chapter 26, verses 16 through 23. Acts 26. 16 through 23. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen, me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, 
then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. We now know from looking at the Apostle Paul that our sovereign and gracious God chooses to use imperfect people to accomplish his purposes. People that we would probably choose to disqualify and people who would have chosen to disqualify themselves. Just think about the examples that we see throughout scripture. The first one that comes to mind to me is um, Matthew chapter one, the genealogy of Christ. Not one perfect person in there. Even great King David, we know that he committed several serious sins. Nobody was perfect. Rahab, a prostitute. Ruth, she was a Moabite widow, an outsider. All of those people, a triumph of grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10 says, For I am the least of the apostles. This is Paul. I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. And then Romans 9 Verses 15 and 16. God says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. All of us deserve God's wrath, God's justice. None of us deserve his mercy. What an incredible truth. I absolutely love what John Piper said. He said, no one has sinned themselves out of grace. No one has sinned themselves out of grace. Aren't you glad we are not the ones deciding who deserves it? From the beginning, God always intended to bring the gospel to the nations. And Jesus himself said that God's plan was always to use Saul. Think about this. Okay, look at Ephesians. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, starting with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth 
In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We ought to praise God for his sovereign grace. Have you trusted in Jesus? As you work on 1 Timothy chapter 1 this week, I pray that you will see that studying the Apostle Paul's personal story was time well spent. When we read the text through the lens of historical context, we magnify God and bring the author's intended meaning into focus. So let's look at the very last lens that biblical lens, biblical context, God working through the text. Stephen Narwald wrote, every verse is connected to the surrounding verses, which are connected to the passage as a whole, which makes up the chapters, which makes up the books. The individual books are all tied to one another because the Bible is one story. And the best way to determine the biblical context of any passage or book that you're studying is to know your Bible. There's no shortcut on that one. When we study, we need to attempt to grasp the part in light of the whole. That's why it's so important for us not just to be studying, but also to have a regular reading plan. Biblical context connects major biblical themes with the grand narrative, the big story of the Bible, which is what we talked about last week. God at work in Christ, reconciling humanity back to himself. Last week, I spoke about the Old Testament painting this portrait of the promised offspring, the one that was to come, the serpent crusher, the Messiah who would who would be the one to provide a way for our relationship with God to be restored. The Old Testament is also a blueprint for Jesus' life in the New Testament. I wish I had time to go and show you all of those ways today, but I'm just going to summarize it really quick. The atonement was more than just Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Thus, Jesus is God doing something as a human for mankind. Where mankind failed over and over, beginning with Adam and Eve, Jesus succeeded. He did what we could not do for ourselves. Jesus lived a life in perfect obedience to the Father. Like the first Adam, Jesus was faced with a decision before a tree. The first Adam said, my will be done. The second Adam said, thy will be done. Jesus is God saving humanity so that we may vicariously be made right with God through him. Literally, this is what it means to be in Christ. His humanity becomes ours when we choose to repent and place our trust in him. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, 
so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This, this, this is the beauty of studying God's word in context. We want the message that God intended to be the message that we receive. We must read and study the Bible through the lens of biblical context in order to magnify God and bring the author's intended meaning into focus. Ladies, the context matters. It matters. Let's commit to always read God's word through these three lenses of context for his glory and for our good. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus. God, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we don't deserve it, yet you give it freely, abundantly, happily. God, help us to not allow the gospel to become old news. Lord, just renew within us this fire, this delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, we love you and praise you. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay. Um, the groups are going to separate a little bit further this week. Hopefully there won't be an issue with noise. <laughs> so Amy's group, if you guys would not mind moving over to this side, and then Shelly's group will move to the, to the back where you were last week. Thank you.